My name is Lacey Leone McLaughlin. This is Unfolding Leadership, and I am honored to introduce James Baker. James is a leading figure in the international media industry. In 2019, as co-CEO of Red Arrow Studios, one of the world's largest creators and distributors of entertainment content, James was named Variety's top 500 global entertainment business leader. He is currently the founder of Silhorn Media Partners, an advisory group providing strategic and growth guidance to media, entertainment, and sports sectors. I am so excited to chat with him about all things leadership. James, thanks for being here today. How are you? I'm great. It's a pleasure to be joining you from London. So before we kind of jump in, talk to me a little bit about the work you're doing, how you're spending your time and what it is you do. As I think with so many people, COVID was a kind of defining moment. And it was certainly a defining moment for me. We were in a sale process for Red Arrow Studios, uh, literally as you know, the world ground to a halt. And that became a difficult deal to do given the circumstances and um, it led me during the first lockdown you know to start thinking about what I was doing with my life and whether I wanted to spend another three or four years working on an, the ultimate sale of the business or not and you know it made me feel very clearly that um, I'd suddenly you know had a realization I'd done 35 plus years of being a good corporate citizen and working for you know great large corporations that I love working with and learned a huge amount from the bosses I had. But it was a great time to actually sort of free myself and figure out whether I could kind of uh, operate more solo. With so many leaders that I talk with during COVID who have made similar changes to you, there was a defining moment or a moment of reflection or a moment where they got kind of smacked in the face and just there was a realization where I need to, I want, I need to do something different. Was that your the case for you or was that something that happened a little more gradually during COVID? No, it was a very specific moment when I was, it was really early on. It was about two months into the first lockdown. So kind of May 2020, you know, 25 years ago, it feels like, um, and I was on the sort of eighth Zoom of the day uh, with one of the companies. And I was on yet another call sort of going, well, we're going to have to trim back, you know, expenses and we're going to have to cut back on this and we're going to have to. And I suddenly kind of went, oh, my God, I, don't, I really don't think I can do another year and a half of Zoom calls where I'm telling people to cut back on their uh, headcount. And, and I went downstairs from from, you know, from the Zoom and sat down with my kind of wife and went, listen, you know, if I say I'm done, are you okay with me saying I'm done? And she went, yeah, by all means. So, you know, very, very clearly remember it was quite emotional because it was a real, it was a genuine jolt where I went, you know, I'm ready to, I, I'm ready to stop this and I'm ready to do something else. And it was, it was with no disrespect to the very large German corporation that owned our group and they couldn't have been more, understanding and we had long discussions about how best to transition and change i don't know if you have gardening do you have gardening leave over there do you have a thing called gardening leave we do not all oh, right well so when you quit a job and you're not allowed to start a new one you got sent on something called gardening leave which yeah. you know theoretically you therefore have a large garden and you go and you tend to your garden instead of talking to anyone or doing so you get sent on gardening leave and, and i hilariously got sent on gardening leave um, at a time when, in fact, you couldn't even go into your garden or anything else. You had to stay inside. So I had a weird kind of COVID-defined gardening leave where I was planning to go to Mozambique diving and ended up, I think, doing a bike round London. That was the best uh-huh. thing. But it was, it, was very, it was a very liberating three months to be in London, which was totally empty, totally empty and deserted. Yeah. And to have that time just to think and reflect and say, right, what do I – what's the next stage of my life? Yeah, yeah. So we all know that leadership is hard, comes with a lot of bumps and bruises. On top of that, a transition during COVID, put on top of that, a brand new company that started during COVID that you're driving, you founded, um, and and really getting off the ground. Talk to me a little bit about how that's been. Um, what I, I, I think the first few months, I deliberately said to myself, I do not have a clue where this is going to go. And I didn't want to define it in any way because 
I genuinely had no idea which direction I would be pulled, whether an opportunity would come from which direction, who I would work with. And that was, again, it gave me real freedom to explore. Where I've ended up a kind of a year later is I'm chairman of a of a new content business called Anyway, uh, which is a fantastic name because everybody says the word anyway at the end of a sentence when they can't think of what to say. They go, well, anyway. Um, <laughs> and it also means that we believe that we need to be able to do content anyway because the ways in which you do and create content are changing and are, are, are altering in fundamental ways. So when we think about the transition from a larger global established organization from a leadership perspective to your transition and how you're leading now, what have been some of the differences? What have been some of the similarities? When you're in large corporations, you learn a great deal about how you interact with people. And a lot of that is, it's what I would call the kind of diplomacy of modern business, where you only get the best out of, you know, teams and out of young talent, if you really nurture them and really get them to understand the opportunity and get rid of that notion of fear. And I think because I've I've been in corporate environments where fear is the defining factor, I think it's the ultimate creativity killer. Mm. Is anybody who's fearful for their job or fearful for their reputation will not make brave creative decisions. And and I still think that's endemic in large creative corporations across the world. There's some exceptions. And I think it's interesting when you look at Netflix and they say, oh, there's a culture of total freedom. And I absolutely hear that that culture from people I speak to at Netflix. I also know there's the classic corporate fear of what's going to what's going to happen if I make a dumb decision? Am I going to lose my job? So I think the learning I've had from that when I transition from large corporation to effectively startups is whoever we engage with and whoever we work with, let's never let fear get in the way of any of their decisions. When you're working with 23, 24, 25 year olds, they actually don't know about failure. So therefore, they really don't worry about failing. And therefore, they're like, why can't I do that? Surely I can just pick up a camera and go shoot that or I'll just go to France and go and sort that. And so you have these great experiences where they kind of go, yeah, we can do that. We'll design that. There's a broader point, which is the old pre-COVID way of creating content is going to go away because the generation that's making really great content now has a whole different set of economics about what that content should cost. So the days of, well, of course, there will be $200 million movies and $10, $15 million per episode drama series. But there will be more and more shows that are shot for a fraction of that cost using amazing technology that's wielded by talent that kind of goes, well, of course I can shoot this in this way. And of course I can edit it in my back room and it's going to look fantastic. And, you know, and, and that's going to be a really fundamental change. And I think it will change the economics of, the business because the people who are consuming that kind of content are perfectly happy watching that level of of creativity and quality without going, oh my God, a hundred people didn't shoot that. And yeah. oh my God, it didn't cost ten million dollars. So I think it's going to be a big change and it's going to be yeah. driven by, you know, I think realistically Gen Z, Gen Z creative talent yeah. under 20 lives. Ch- change is hard. Change is abs- absolutely hard. Hard. So how do you get out of your own way as the leader and making sure that you're enhancing that creative creativity rather than getting in the way? So how have you gone about making that change? Talking less is is really useful because again, in a large corporate environment, everybody, if you're the boss, everyone looks to you to say, well, of course, we're gonna do this, or this is our strategy. And actually, again, in a in a more creative, more startup environment. You need to listen. You don't need to talk. And you need to say, okay, in my experience, this is the area we should maybe be exploring. Now let's discuss how we should attack that. You know, if you look at Squid Games on Netflix, again, who'd have thought? Who'd have thought a, you know, Korean language crazy drama series would be the biggest show on Netflix? Nobody, nobody, not in a million years would have said it. So you never know where the next great idea is going to come. And it's usually going to be driven increasingly by, you know, groups in social media who grab an idea and go, wow, this is great and this is different. And that's revolutionary because it means that the decisions aren't being made by a bunch of people in an ivory tower. They're being made by the the viewers. 
So what advice do you have for individuals who have maybe been in the workforce a little bit longer and are finding themselves working with newer generations that are sort of pushing the boundaries a bit? What advice do you have for those folks to capitalize on all that innovation, sort of get out of their own way and do things differently? I, I think it's a really interesting question because I think there's a whole, well, there's there's a whole generation of, I would say, 45 pluses, nominally 45 plus, maybe 50 plus, who don't want to be put on the scrap heap and told that they're too old and are actually carrying huge amounts of wisdom and experience about, you know, what works and what doesn't work and how to not screw up and all of that business. But uh, so, you know, my advice to any of those is the more you can dive in and involve yourself with that young creative talent, whether you can mentor young talent or whether you can get involved with the development process, professional development process of, again, that 20-something group of go and do as much as you can to hang out with them, watch the stuff that they're creating, try to understand the, the, to me, rapidly emerging economics of content creation and content financing you know, you, there's no excuse for not knowing about NFTs and how they're going to change the way in which content funding is is approached. Uh, you just got to read a lot, and I, and that's the other thing is just just really re-educate yourself. It's easy to do; it won't necessarily cost you money. But um, I would say re-educate and reconnect with with that generation. So listen, learn, connect making sure you're hearing what they have to say and making sure that you're capitalizing on the creativity that's coming out of this group that isn't quite as bound by standard norms in the workplace. Yeah. And don't feel, don't feel bad that your wisdom, your wisdom won't go to waste. You, 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 there is enormous to me, certainly in the production business, I'm, you know, one of the most prolific and best producers I've worked with is 75 now. And she is, as incredibly powerful and brilliant at what she does as anybody I know in the industry. And she ain't stopping soon. And I just want to, I want to plug into her knowledge on a regular basis because she's done everything. So, and and, and all I'd say, if I was going to reverse that question is to 20 somethings is go find those kinds of mentors who can really help you understand the road bumps that you're going to hit when you, you know, try and do this incredible new thing, it's, you're going to screw up. So, A, don't be scared of screwing up because that's how you learn and find mentors that can help you just understand the kind of some of the wisdom of the ridiculous business that the TV and film industry is. And it is, by the way, it's a, it's a ridiculous business. When you think about your career and you think about yourself starting out 30 years ago and you think about yourself today, what were a couple of words that described you as a leader or as an employee 30 years ago? Um, that's a really good question. I think as a first as an employee, I was so fascinated by the process of creating TV that it was like the best hobby in the world. I'm in love with the process. Even now, I'm in love with it as, as I ever was. But and back then, I remember when I was you know starting out, it was that passion for understanding the process and learning. And then as I kind of grew into leadership positions, I think the biggest thing I tried to concentrate on was empowering really smart people around me because I realized really quickly that if you surround yourself with smart people, you look remarkably smart yourself. And there's no way I would ever know everything ever, but I know lots of people who do and therefore that makes my life a lot easier. So I always tried to surround myself with really smart teams that were kind of gave me a 360 degree view of whatever the challenge there was, whether it was marketing or comms or creativity. Or, and by the way, of you know, I, the one thing I'd say to every single person who's starting up a business is find someone who's financially numerate, who can work with you from the very beginning. Because the greatest ideas in the world fail because they've got flawed business plans or their P&Ls are, are kind of got holes in them or you don't understand, you don't understand about the basics of, of, of accounting and running a business. And I would say, I've said this to young people who go, I've got this great idea. And I go, that's great. You know, you've got to understand about cash burn. You've got to understand about cash flow. You've got to understand, otherwise forget it. And that's the only thing I'd say is 
these days, instead of going to business school, you can go and do an online, you know, masterclass course in that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It'll cost you $50. You will learn m- more important stuff from that than almost anything else you do. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So you talked a lot about passion. You talked a lot about enabling, putting the right people around you. How has that tra- change transitioned to how you think about yourself as a leader today? You know, I genuinely don't feel I'm a leader at the moment. And I, I, I actually think it's a probably it's a negative. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a negative word that I wouldn't necessarily want to equate with what I'm doing. Uh, I just feel I'm on a new journey. And I'm mm-hmm. one of a group of people who are on that journey. I can leverage the fact that there's perhaps a perception that I'm an industry leader or I'm a senior industry figure or a veteran or whatever you say. Yeah. Um, and that's useful because it means you can go see people that you know or you can open doors. That, that. But ultimately, I don't want to be perceived to be a leader. I want to be perceived to be, you know, really hungry and really open to new opportunities yeah. and really accessible. And it's this accessibility is – you know, if people, anybody wants to come and talk and knock around ideas or they need a little bit of advice, again, I don't know everything, but I probably know other people who know something as well. That's fascinating. So I, I want to dig into uh, uh, this a little bit about sort of leader having a bit of a negative connotation for you right now. Um, say, say more about that. I, I, I want to hear. I want to hear what wherever that's coming from. There are lots of different kinds of bosses. Mm-hmm. There are, and and. I, and I think you get this. I think there's, I'm going to make a sweeping generalization. I've, Go worked, for it. I've worked for male bosses and I've worked for an, an amazing group of female, of, of female bosses. And by a mile, the people who've had the biggest effect on me were the female bosses rather than the male bosses. There was none of that sort of alpha male thing. And they were always, you never perceived them to be in a, ivory tower leadership yeah. position where you couldn't go listen i've got a problem I, and they were universally just part of a collegiate team yeah. and that's that helped me mold the fact that i don't want to be perceived to be someone who's unapproachable or that's ego scary or, or an ego i think egos yeah. you know and absolutely it's a bit like fear you know ego in a i mean there's more egos in our industry than you could ever shake a stick at but mm-hmm. I think in certain environments, I think it's incredibly destructive. I would say the word leader can be pejorative because it it says there's this person out front who's in charge and you know, and it's like I just don't buy that. I think you're a I'm I much I much prefer the hive mind concept where you surround yourself with, you know, super smart people and if one of you fails, the other people will support that person. And if I'm sitting in the middle of that hive, that's great. But I know I've got all that support, and um, but I'm not perceived to be the leader. And I, do, I make that. I think the hive mentality is a bad analogy because usually the one in the middle gets eaten. But maybe that's maybe that's true in business. Is you know you sit in the middle until you get eaten, and then you know someone else in the hive takes over. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I I love this. You might not like this, but I love that you're leading without and probably doing a hell of a job, it sounds like, without wanting to acknowledge that you're leading, which is part of the beauty of being, you know, a coach and a teacher and a mentor and all of those things that make other people around you or enable other people around you to be your best. Um, And it's it's great to hear that that's what you're doing without acknowledging that that's what you want to be doing and even thinking, oh, I want to avoid that because it sounds kind of shitty. Well, that's a, you know, that to me is an achievement. And that's a very kind thing for you to say. But I think there is an extraordinary woman called Jerry Laybourne who founded Nickelodeon, who was uh, absolutely at the forefront of creating a really revolutionary new TV experience for kids in Nickelodeon. And Jerry was, uh, she was a proper leader. I mean, he used the word leader. She was, again, could, you know, completely collegiate, completely involving, empowering. But when the, when you needed the steel, when you needed the the real support and the protection, she was, you know, a warrior and she was amazing. And, and of all of my, you know, bosses I've had, she was deeply inspirational. And I learned a huge amount from Jerry, you know, to create an extraordinary business in Nickelodeon. You should interview Jerry. She's a proper leader. <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks. I'll, I'll reach out to Jerry. Um 
Any good stories about lessons learned from your time working for her? I mean, was there a moment where you were you were, you were like, oh, this balance that she has is amazing, and I want to emulate that? Any anything you can share with people? A story there? A good experience and a and a bad experience. And a good experience, you know, was when we launched Nickelodeon uh, in the UK, which was what I when I first got involved with Nickelodeon. Um, Jerry Hand wrote notes to everybody on the team uh not just you know hurrah but really heartfelt special handwritten notes saying that's an incredible achievement you you should reflect back and look at what you've done and i, I gotta say it was an amazing thing to get and for the whole team it was a really inspiring thing simple much better than a here's a bottle of champagne or you know an email or whatever the personal touch and 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 creating that personal connection I think was a huge learning the other thing was you know quite early on during Nickelodeon we we had like all launches we had a really rough launch and nobody was watching and we thought uh, and I really kind of hit rock bottom and I remember sitting in a conference room in New York kind of going this just isn't working I'm not right for it this is I you know I'm done I'm I'm going to go back to doing something else and she sat me down she literally sat on the floor next to me and kind of went, you just got to stick at it because it might be really shit now, but give it three months, give it six months. I guarantee you we'll find a solution to this. And that's not something you would find from many male bosses. A male boss would go, come on, sort it out, chin up, sort yourself out. And get it get, together. Get it together. You know, your job's on the line. And but Jerry, you know, there was this amazing sort of connectivity and, and patience and uh, sympathy and even empathy because she was going, she was telling me about experiences where she'd been looking at abject failure <laughs> and going, yeah, it's going to be all right. And, you know, again, it, it was a very emotional, that kind of stuff is pretty emotional, pretty emotional experiences. And and I think that that's the biggest learning is if you can build positive emotion into a corporate environment, I think that's a very special thing. It's interesting. As you were talking and all of the questions that I've asked, I keep writing down getting out of the way, right? So when you were talking about fear, it's how do you get fear out of the way so people can be their best? When you were talking about early generations, it was about listening and enabling and getting out of the way and letting old corporate structures get out of the way. When you talked about leadership, it was about enabling and getting out of the way. And when you just talked about that story with Jerry, it sounds like it was almost the first time where somebody got out of the way. It's a very elegant way of of, of describing it. And, and I hadn't thought, this is good, I'm getting free therapy out of this. Um, I hadn't thought about it in that way, but I think if you can set the course and be as clear as you possibly can be about the goal of where you're trying to head, mm -hmm. and then you go, and now I'm going to step back and let you guys get on with the job of seeing how we get there. I've learned something as a result of that discussion because I think that's a, a really, it's a really smart way of looking at it. And now that you've told me, I'm going to steal it. And tell <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. It's all yours. Actually, it is all yours. It was yours. And I just said it back to you. <laughs> How do you balance your excitement and passion and the need to get work done through others and enable that work with wanting to get in there and do it yourself? Because I can see how much you light up, but it also sounds like you're not the expert to go in there and maybe do the rendering, but you're the person kind of making sure the output is where it needs to be. I think I learned quite early about recognizing my limitations. Nobody is great at doing everything. And in fact, what you end up being is you end up being great at doing two or three things. Even the very best bosses in the world are just good at doing two or three things. And the clever thing is they've recognized what they're not good at so that they can actually go, I've got this great idea, but I can't execute it, but you can help me execute it because you're really good at that. So I think knowing your limitations is the sort of key part of it. And I, I genuinely, I know I can't direct. I know I haven't got the patience to edit. Uh, I absolutely can't draw, uh, and I'm really bad at the guitar. So, you know, I, I have to find other people to do all that. So really, it's just making up for my lack of uh, talent by surrounding myself with clever people. It's, it's another another bit of therapy that I'm now realising. You're, you're inducing breakdown. That's what worries <laughs> So I would summarize that as saying, 
sort of, you get to nerd out on the things that you love and then you get out of the way. Yeah. I mean, it's exactly that. It's kind of the ultimate rock fan concept is where you kind of go, I'd love to be in a rock band, but I can't play the guitar. But boy, I know some people are really good at the guitar and I can sit backstage and go, look at my band. It's great. <laughs> and that's really what the film and TV business is, is producers just put bands together and go, and then take the glory and go, did you see my band? I know I wasn't playing in it, but did you see my band? So yeah, I'm, I'm a frustrated performer. I'm a frustrated, you know, I think all producers, all all people who aren't brilliant creative talents are just, um, you know, they're just they're just wannabes. wannabes. Or, or I would say enable of other people putting the best content out in the world. Yeah. Somebody's got to do it, right? Maybe. I, mean, I think that's that, that gives it a positive shine that may not yeah. be true. Hey, well, I think the, the the people out there that consume the content would say uh, they're happy it's there and it probably doesn't happen without people in roles like yours, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think I think the biggest challenge for the the visual content business is this this issue of quality versus quantity, which is in a world that is flooded with so much content, of which ninety nine percent of it is is just rubbish. Mm. Is how do you pick your way through that and find the diamonds? And I think oddly, the to to throw one back at you. Mm-hmm. The growth and development of podcasting and audio content has proved that people have got an attention span that's longer than five minutes or two minutes. Yeah, I because agree. Their desire and their ability to listen to stories or listen to interesting people talking yeah. for half an hour or 45 minutes or an hour, to me, has again challenge this perception that people have just got these short attention spans. I agree. And it also just reminds us of our capacity and desire to, to do things differently, um, to learn, to educate, to spend time on thinking about how we show up, uh, which is, which is exactly why we're here talking today. Um, exactly those reasons. So I'm, I'm hopeful. I, you know, I spend all of my time working, working with leaders and I think the pandemic in particular and, the world in the last couple of years and the questions that we've been forced to ask ourselves is really kind of helping us redefine how we show up, what's important to us, what it looks like. And I think you're a really great example of that, right? I mean, you had a great career. I've read about you, had a lot of success and decided to do something different and have an impact on people in a very different way. Um, And so far, it sounds amazing. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's yeah. Been it's been a pleasure talking about myself. Yeah, good. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad, but you probably don't do it enough. Probably don't do it enough. I know our listeners are going to really enjoy hearing about that and you really get some great lessons from that. But as we sign off, what's the one thing you want to leave them with? What's that one most important piece of advice that you hope sticks with them as they think about their own journey and maybe making a change? I would say to anyone who's sitting there wanting to create, is that the barriers that used to be there are just not there anymore. So go and create. Whatever you do, if you feel you've got a book in you, if you feel you can write great articles, if you feel you want to go and film something, you know, a little doc, go do it because the technology is in your hand now Mm. or it's on your laptop now and the platforms are out there for you to publish. And this glorious connection between content and community is something that you can celebrate anybody who's a creator of any kind is go create because it's better than sitting passively just consuming other people's stuff go make your own stuff wherever you are yeah yeah i i think that actually translates really beautifully to all industries and to all people which is you know go do something different go innovate go change go think about it um which is really amazing. And then my last note for you is um, as, as coach, I just, I can't resist, right? Clearly you're doing a whole heck of a lot of things, right? You've had an amazing, impeccable journey. And I'm sure there are leaders out there who have similar stories for you. So I would encourage you as you think about what's next to think about the impact that you're having own it and be proud of it in a way that Jerry probably is of the story that you told about her. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your time today. It It was a pleasure. Thanks, James. What I'm left thinking about is James's challenge to go create 
to eliminate barriers and to get it done. With time, with resources, what would you do? What barriers do you think actually exist? And my question to you is, are they real? Should you be thinking about it differently? This is episode 10. Thanks for listening.